Stop me if you've heard this before, but I can't help but feel overwhelmed sometimes. In today's digital age, information moves so fast that its rapid nature is basically one with contemporary culture. There is so much content that even in one lifetime, you wouldn't be able to consume even half of it, let alone all of it. Of course, you know about the perhaps infamous brain rot inducing <laughs> It's indicative of the current state of content, which can cynically and maybe quite aptly be described as consumable. Things are moving so fast and are, are so self-referential that you can barely keep up. Yet somehow we do. Paired with this is the ever increasing awareness of our, our lower attention spans, you know, doom scrolling, the lower attention span. In this video, I want to explore what's making us feel this way, why everything feels like too much. So uh, buckle up. Also, hi, I'm Dylan. Notwithstanding any economic or political factors, it's never been easier than ever to access information online. If you need to know something, there's a good chance that it's on the internet. I mean, lest it be some obscure piece of media. Back in ye olden days, the speed of which information flowed was leagues slower than it is now. You had to send letters, and then like the telegraph, and then radio came, and then phone calls, uh, you know, it took us a couple hundred years, but we're fully connected now. Here comes the internet. It's not only possible, but plausible to transmit to the world any piece of information you want in no time at all. So if you pair today's internet with billions of people who are using it, a lot of people are gonna be sending information all at once. Can you even count how many posts you've scrolled by? How many articles you've read? How many vine booms you've heard? Do you, do you remember any of them? Let's break this down into three arguments to explain you know, how we have this massive sea of the internet right now. The abundance of content, rapid distribution slash rapid dissolution, and the vine boom. And yes, I promise that last one's relevant. Just stay with me. We are spoiled for content nowadays. You have effectively unlimited options when it comes to entertainment. So the phrase, I don't have anything to watch is, you know, kind of wrong. That's a different issue. Here's the magic word, content, be it videos, images, etc. doesn't just come from nowhere, it has to have a creator. And this content also doesn't go nowhere, it also has to have a user. So the creator produces something consumable for you, the user, to, you know, receive and engage with. What makes content distinct today is the barrier to entry. It is leagues easier to become a, a YouTuber than it is a TV celebrity. If you have a phone, which I mean, you likely do if you're watching this, and an internet connection, which I mean, how are you watching this? You can be a YouTuber, a creator, right now. And because it's easier than ever, there are astronomically more YouTubers than there are like senators. And because there's a truckload of creators, that's a lot of viewers, a lot of users to that content, you know, that can also become creators themselves. In a sense, you can call this democratization of entertainment. After all, this abundance of content isn't just limited to YouTube. I mean, anybody can go viral on TikTok and, you know, anybody can be a journalist on Twitter. Anybody can be a musician on SoundCloud, Bandcamp, whatever. And there's a good chance that you've tried before. As much as the term influencer makes my skin crawl a little bit, it's very apt. They influence both the users and their fellow creators with said content. Okay, get ready for the worst comparison you've ever heard. Take former US Senator Joseph McCarthy as an example. This creator of his content, you know, like his anti-communist red scare rhetoric, was created for basically the entirety of the United States. You know, the users. You, <laughs> you could argue that he was an influencer because he influence both the everyday American citizens and also, you know, his fellow politicians. Maybe not single-handedly, but he was definitely a key player. You know, and then a bunch of other stuff happened, and then uh, he got kind of disgraced, and now he's dead. So now take Jimmy, Mr. Beast Donaldson. <laughs> just, just roll with it. As a creator, you know, he's pioneered the genre of super expensive stunts and, you know, 
influence our philanthropy. His content today involves, you know, high stakes and massive numbers created to play into the YouTube algorithm, which, you know, feeds to the YouTube users. And he's also an influencer because he influenced fellow creators. And now we have loads of copycat Mr. Beast clones. And also he influences his audience as users, which consists of all like nine year olds. These two insanely popular public figures have both created content and they made it for their respective users. Difference is Mr. B started out making Minecraft videos with a free version of Bandicamp, whereas McCarthy, uh, he, he went to law school. Okay, I realize how extreme of a comparison this is, but it is without a doubt easier to start creating and growing a successful online presence than it is growing a successful platform in politics through the instantaneous nature of internet tools. Like, like I'm not directly comparing Mr. Beast to, to McCarthy, okay? No human being has watched the majority of content that exists on the internet, let alone every single piece of it. This this massive mountain of stuff is, is just there. New content is being made at a constant rate all the time. <laughs> there is no stopping the content machine. You'll always see something new come up. It'd be like world news, uh, petty drama, product launches, uh, fashion trends, catastrophe, disaster, especially catastrophe and disaster. We, internet users, are subjected to this ever-changing sludge, if you want to call it, every day. And somehow we just, we just take it in, right? That's just, there's just so much of everything. I want to touch briefly on sensory overload, overstimulation, whatever you want to call it. Sensory overload happens when you receive too much input, you know, more than your body and your mind can handle. So seeing and, and listening and touching and tasting, whatever, s smelling all at once will probably do it. You know, doom scrolling and you know, getting constantly updated with new stuff can be a source of this overstimulation, which can lead you to feeling irritable and overwhelmed. Humans are, are, are bad at multitasking, which is pretty well documented in many studies. If you're typing a paper uh, while listening to music, watching a the video essay, you know, scrolling through social media, sorry, you're not really multitasking, you're simply switching from task to task. In a 1995 study, Dr. Robert Rogers and Dr. Stephen Monsell found that people were slower when switching from these tasks. You know, moving from music to a video to your, your work involves these switch costs, meaning every time you switch task, your performance falters. Murray Huang, a psychologist from the Indigo Project, puts it quite aptly. Being inundated with excessive news can lead to overstimulation and stress as it's often negative, and we have a negativity bias, the tendency to give more importance to negative rather than positive events. We can't help but remember the anxiety-provoking news headlines and stories. What catches your eye more? the best movie you've ever seen or the worst movie you haven't seen. As humans, we're naturally wary of bad things. It's how we survived. This exposure to massive amounts of just news and info and whatnot is a tiny, tiny microcosm of our existence. In other words, we don't really know how to deal with it. We're only barely starting to understand, you know, what effects the internet has on us. And, and even that's like shaky at best. Do you remember this report? from Meta on Instagram. Yes, while Instagram did make body image issues worse for one out of three teen girls, for most people, it tended to make things better. In a previous video, not on this channel, that I made talking about my experience deleting social media, I talked about how context matters. In a nutshell, if your entire support system, like, you know, your friends and your family and you know, every connection you have. If they're all on social media and you take the advice of, oh, delete social media, then you're kind of screwed, right? There goes your support system. It just makes everything worse, despite, you know, the silver bullet of deleting social media is pitched as. So things are complicated, newsflash. There's so much of everything and we don't know how to deal with it. And I also don't know how to end this section. Uh... Car metaphor. Computers and internet speeds have only gotten faster and faster. As internet usage becomes more and more demanding, computers need to keep up. And so do you. Information moves at breakneck speeds faster than we can even understand it. And I'm getting out of here, it is so hot. You can get almost anything instantly now, you know, be it education, entertainment, shopping, social. Theoretically, you could live almost every aspect of your life online. If you have a question, there's a good chance you'll get an answer within seconds. Uh, if you're bored, you have a world of entertainment at your fingertips. 
you know, what else? If you need something physical, right, you'll just be, you'll be limited solely by your parcel service. This rapid distribution of content is no longer just a benefit, it's an expectation. According to 2016 data from Google, 53% of visits to sites are abandoned if the page doesn't load within three seconds. So not a lot of time at all. While this expectation of instantaneousness is, you know, just naturally a result of how fast we're getting this information, our desire for fast everything is perhaps very intentional. Do you notice how easy it is for you to start doom scrolling, you know, post after post with nothing really of substance? You know, every single piece of content that you just scroll by is somehow appealing to you, despite like the gargantuan amount there is. You know, you also get ads for something that you were just talking about in the real world. It's like they can read your mind. You know what? It's often not even something you really want to see. You're hooked whether you like it or not. And you stay trapped, well aware of how much you need to stop. You know, it's no secret that companies collect data to personalize or, or tailor your experience or whatever. In Meta's privacy policy, you know, like Facebook, Instagram, any other affiliated products, they collect info you provide, you know, your email, phone number, your name, what you do, what you click on, likes, what you send, etc. your friends, your followers, info on your device, like what kind of phone do you have or well, how big's the screen, info from partners, which is what you do outside the platform, provided they have partnerships with Meta, which, you know, many tend to, and uh, a whole lot more. So like um, everything. That personalized experience that we're so used to is only possible because of this data. When you clicked agree for signing up to your account, you gave those companies permission to do so. I mean, I mean, sometimes you don't even have to agree. It's just how many times have you read by using our site, you agree to the use of cookie. There's a great article by the New York Times that goes into depth uh, on TikTok's recommendation system. So I'll link it down below. But in a nutshell, you know, we know that retention is king. Whatever grabs your attention and holds it wins. <sighs> the infamous <laughs> is a reflection of this. So if you're not really up to speed already, good luck. <laughs> the really fast cuts, the zoom ins on faces, captions on every word, bright saturated colors, the unrelated gameplay loop video, uh, arbitrary sound effects, motion blur, the sharpness, clarity, all the way up. Self-referential means, which we'll get to later. And more. And hey, I, I probably missed a couple things, but you know, that's how wild it is. And like, hey, I'll admit it, right? I'm no stranger to this editing style. I probably used some in this video, but you know, even I find it entertaining. I laugh at it. But from a third person, you know, outside perspective, this is sensory overload and it's kind of, ugh, you know, if retention or, you know, watch time is key to being rewarded by the algorithm with views, then people will do whatever it takes to get that retention. Hence the unrelated subway servers gameplay. So what about political discourse? You know, uh, retention and watch time needs to go up. So all the sense, uh, all the sensationalism is just ramped up to 11. Haven't you noticed that everyone's just kind of yelling at each other more and more? Political discourse online and in media has been transformed into just mudslinging arguments, right? Calling each other names. It's, it's literal kindergartner insult. It's just high school drama again. I, I can't prove this, so take it with a grain of salt. But, you know, in addition to wanting more retention, I think in addition, this demand, if you want to call it that, in editing style of the, you know, fast cuts and all of that is a result of both, you know, I mentioned before, the abundance of content and the rapid distribution of content. That mountain of content is just easily reachable in no time at all. Even if we'll never watch it all, we'll want more anyway. You know, more extreme, more bombastic, more faster. And just as fast as we get this content, it vanishes. You don't remember every meme you scroll by, nor every news slash article that you see. And on its own, that's not even a bad thing, right? I mean, like, why would you remember them? That's that's not the point. But because of how fast content just comes and goes, we're always gonna be wanting more and more. After all, there's, you can only entertain someone with this for so long. People get bored. Like, I, I hope you're not bored watching this video, but you know. How many times have you gone to the bathroom and just thought to yourself, man, I could be scrolling Twitter right now, or, I mean, actually, I don't know why you would wanna go on Twitter. Or how much time have you spent looking for a video to eat while you eat mac and cheese or something? Our reliance on the internet because of all these systems in place has made it inseparable. I think the point that Nathan Jurgensen makes here is 
quite relevant. In his article, he rejects the notion of uh, digital dualism. The distinction between the real world and the digital world is a fallacy, as they're both more or less meshed together. Nobody is really online or offline anymore. You carry a powerful computer wherever you go. Uh, you communicate through digital means, right? You can be pinged at any time where we're all cyborgs. People wanting more and faster can lead to dangerous situations. Symptoms of pornography addiction, for example, can include uh, risky behavior in order to consume more just inappropriate places or even viewing more extreme, perhaps illegal material just to get that same high. And because it's easy to access, it's quick and there's lots of it, you get the idea. I'm not saying that you watching TikTok 12 hours a day will 100% make you a serial killer, right? Not at all. But with our mountain of content and, you know, how fast it comes and goes, it's, well, not helping much, really. Just, uh, take it as you will. That was dark. Uh... <laughs>on a lighter note you know the vine boom even if not by name you've you've heard of it before today in a 2023 context it is so far removed from its original uh, meaning let's turn back the clock a little bit the earliest known use of this sound effect was on the titular vine platform for those uninitiated vine was a platform where its whole gimmick was that you only had six seconds to make a video the vine boom is reportedly first used by King Botch, the most popular Viner to have ever existed in the late social media. On April 10th, 2014, this Vine was posted. Damn, I look good. What happened to these smashing your girl. Hey. How they do that? And I say this with zero sarcasm, this single sound effect and this video has changed contemporary internet culture like forever. And because of King Bots' notoriety at the time, this was everywhere. Okay, well, I wrote that it was everywhere. I, I think it was everywhere because, you know, doing research for this video, I could, like, barely find any vines that had the vine boom. Like, I have a couple. Hey, kid, you want some blades? No. Blades are for skating. Hit dingus. Kind of snowy. I knew it! Hello, alarm! Oh, you call at the same time every morning! Hello? Speak, bitch! Yo, Brandon, what's number one? Brandon, Brandon! Oh, oh. Maybe I'm remembering wrong, but I, I don't think so. It was a real cultural phenomenon. I know you rem I know you remember. As you can guess, it was mostly used like on top of a surprise action or, you know, waking up in disbelief. <laughs> Savage moment. <laughs> yeah, it's a twist. Well, you know, you get the point. Fast forward to today. It no longer only represents surprise, savage twists, whatever. It's just, it's just everything. John Cena speaking it's Mandarin. Really Manscape well, ad that every time they say balls. Anytime that anyone at all raises an eyebrow. Yeah. It's not even a surprise twist anymore. It's like it originally was. Not only is the use of the vine boom just kind of arbitrary, it's also like sort of expected. Like the vine boom is just so prevalent in, in just modern video, right? It's everywhere. And you know what? The vine boom that we know today wasn't even made for like a comedic connotation. It's from this 2012 sound pack video. Cinematic session, industrial samples and impacts, boom sound effects, metal sound effects. It is literally just some metal hitting the floor. And now the new joke is metal pipe hitting the floor. It's this. It's <laughs> okay, lengthy and arguably unnecessary explanation aside, you need to understand, and you likely already do understand this context before you would engage in the 2023 version of this meme. You can boil it down to this old thing that was genuinely funny is now sarcastically funny. A lot of people use the term ironic to describe these types of memes, and yeah, I mean, I mean, kind of, like, sarcasm is, is a bit more accurate, I think, and you know, sarcasm is kind of a type of, uh, well, I mean, the original term for meme comes from Richard Dawkins' 1976 book, The Selfish Gene, whereas the gene transmits genetic information, like certain biological, physiological traits, I don't know, you know, hair color, eye color, height, general health, you know, etc. The meme transmits cultural information, you know, ideas, symbols, traditions, culture, that kind of thing. Memes undergo natural selection, much like genes do. Like, say, for example, the meme of rewinding your tapes before you send them back to the video store is largely dead because the world has mostly moved on to, you know, streaming and other practices. 
Similarly, the vine boom has mutated into something beyond its original form, as the ironic, sarcastic use survived, and not the sincere use. And this is where we could get into post-irony and like simulacra and whatever, but this video is like already long enough, so maybe next time. Memes in an internet... And I'd say this definition still largely applies. Memes in an internet context is more than just funny pictures and videos. They still remain units of, of culture and of experience. Memes about the absurdity of life, you know, fandom memes, uh, uh, memes made so unfunny that they're just funny again. Despite us becoming more or less one with the internet, like I've argued before, it still has this distinct culture that doesn't really resonate with everyone. Like, you know, you and your mom probably have a phone, right? But I don't think your mom is going to understand why you're laughing at metal pipes falling sound effects. Maybe you don't understand either. That's okay. And you can see why this just reinforces how overwhelming the internet is. I mean, internet memes you might see just nowadays, they have like this chaotic beauty to it. Like, loud equals funny was and still kind of is a critique of, of deep fried memes that like, oh, how it's not so funny. But, you know, I could see that loud it does equal funny. The abundance of content everywhere to how fast it comes and goes is perfectly reflected in today's internet meme space. And I, I zero sarcasm again. Can you explain to someone why, you know, looking at your thumb and saying sussy sussy was so funny like just a couple years ago? Or it's why like this humor does not really gel with a lot of the older generations, right? It's just, you know, so fast. There's just so much of everything. I think this germa bit is a really, really good explanation. Jeez, it's just, it's too much going on. Zoomer humor, I don't know. You know what it is? It's the fact that there are just so many sound effects. And so it's so fast, like that, like, it's just like your brain doesn't know what else to do besides laugh because there's no other emotion that makes any sense at all. That segues us, that f Everything I just talked about, every tiny little detail I just threw in your face for the last -ish. minutes. We know, we know all of this. This is not a novel concept. I'm not really breaking any ground here. Everyone and their dog is aware of how all the content we consume is just sludge nowadays and or how everything, every social platform, every influencer, they all want your attention. Or even how, you know, 21st century humor is <laughs> It's a little bit brain dead, if we're being honest. Even before you clicked on this video, I'm sure you've been aware of, of, of something, anything I mentioned in the video, and, you know, probably some stuff outside the video as well. And and look, I'm, I'm clearly appealing to an audience here, but growing up with the internet, is, it's a weird thing. Everything I just talked about, the abundance of contents, rapid distribution, the memes, and everything you just, we just know, we've, we've internalized all of this. And that's what I mean by overwhelmed. The human mind hasn't been subjected to this much stuff ever. That's why like millennials and zoomers and whatever's next, we everyone's confused and just the older generations are just laughing at us while this chaos just happens. Oh, they don't even know what stress is. Ha 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 ha. Sorry, I was too busy realizing that there's nothing I can do against the incoming climate crisis uh, or fight against hate against marginalized groups uh, or maybe thrive in this increasingly bleak economy or, I don't know, fight for my own ideals and break the status quo. I was just so busy discovering that none of this intrinsically matters and just to carve my own path and to rebel against the absurdity of this, this, this whole thing. I was just too busy watching the 24-7 news cycle on my phone, on TV, from real people. I was just too busy finding humor to cope with increasingly bleak subjects and revitalizing sincere jokes to make them get sarcastic, ironic jokes to make them even funnier. I was just too busy getting everything I ever wanted to know at breakneck speaks and, and still wanting more. Sorry, I was too busy drowning in the sea of everything ever made and will ever be made. The film Everything Everywhere All at Once is an allegory. What happens when you have everything coming at you at the same time? If you've seen everything, then nothing really matters. You might as well implode in a void of nothingness, rather than face the fact that everything you do is without consequence. It's tiring. It's overwhelming. I'm not going to spoil it, because I really, really recommend you go see it if you haven't. But I will bring up this. Daniel Kwan, one of the co-directors for Everything Everywhere, uses this multiverse as a metaphor for internet overload. Written in 2016, Everything Everywhere was in part a product of the contradictions and emotional whiplash of being very online at the time. The internet had started to create these alternate universes, said Quan. 
We were for the first time realizing how scary the internet was, moving from this techno-optimism to this techno-terror. I think this movie was us trying to grapple with that chaos. Grappling with that chaos is something we deal with every day, whether you realize it or not. Why would you act against hate when another group would just take its place? Why fight climate crises when the individual is simply too weak? Why do anything when your actions have no consequence? Again, it's just too much. But that's exactly why we should just do something, anything. If anything we do doesn't really matter, then it won't matter whether you fall flat on your face or whether you succeed. My point is, even though that we're drowning in this sea of digital everything and how all this stuff doesn't really have any real intrinsic meaning, we should embrace it. Yeah, we'll, we'll shoehorn a bit of existentialism here, yeah. Pfft, yeah. It's, it's a weird way of thinking, but, but chaos is not really a bad thing, nor is it really a good thing. It just, it just kind of is. With what we talked about today, you know, abundance of content, how fast it comes and goes, and, you know, how self-referential everything is, it's okay to feel like you don't know what's going on. It's okay to feel like your brain is just one big mess, because, well, you're not alone. We're always told disaster after disaster, and, you know, we're barked at and commanded that things you have to do to solve this thing now. And you feel like you just have so much to do, but with so little time and with very little drive. What matters is that we try. We try to fight this overwhelmingness, and in the process, we just do things. If you feel like you're drowning, you're not the only one. Far from it. Just because your consequences may or may not be impactful, it doesn't mean what you're feeling isn't real. How sad, how joyful, how angry and how scared you might be is very real. It's as real as you want it to be, after all. And if you feel like to fight against this sea of just everything is to do things that make you happy, then so be it. Touch grass is a bit of a joke nowadays. It's advice given to terminally online people, as if, you know, not all of us are kind of, in a sense, terminally online. But in all sincerity, it, it is good advice. If you feel overwhelmed, you know, take a break, right? It's good to step away from the Twitter cesspit, you know, once in a while. Or just forever. It's good to step away from how fast everything is and, you know, demand for action now and keeping up with the latest whatever. Like, you know, go bake a cake, go for a walk and or, or something, I don't know. Even though I've argued that, you know, we're basically one with our internet selves and our real selves, until we have like brain implants that'll just have us forever literally tethered to the internet. You can still have a life outside the internet, and I imagine you very well might have already. I know it's a lot, but try not to feel too bad. Okay? Hey, thanks for watching. I really hope you enjoyed because pff, I spent a ridiculous amount of hours working on the script. Um, I think it's like it's like 4,700 something words, right? I don't know how long the video is at this point, but would really appreciate it. If you liked it, please share this with someone that you might think might get a kick out of it. And hey, if you want to see more of these, consider subscribing because I do plan to make more of these like long reflective type videos, video essays if you want to call it that. But yeah, leave a like if you liked it. Don't leave a like if you don't like it. Or dislike it, it doesn't matter anyways. And yeah, okay, I'm gonna go take a nap. All right, so.